now the darkness is, is gone, uh, <laughs> the morning has come, and yeah. uh, we have time for That's some dialogue with uh, the audience. We have approximately 20 minutes or so before the, the final closing uh, round for, from the panel. Uh, I will open for comments and uh, uh, questions. I will ask you to be brief. I'm, uh, I have a lot of questions myself on my blog, but I hope I will not have to use <laughs> any of them. Um, we do not have microphones for the audience, so when I give somebody the floor, you will have to stand up and please present yourself and your affiliation, and you have to speak loudly and clearly, and absolutely no more than one minute. And it's, uh, you may have short comments, but for the most part we would like questions. And if you know which member of the panel you will address the question to, you will please do that. And I will have Christian over here who will help me to uh, to make a list of, of the people, so, so you have to catch his eye as, as well as, as mine. So, who wants to start? Uh, over there? Yes? Yep. Uh, I have a question to the last speaker. I was very interested what you said. Your name, please. Your name, please. My name is Tori Nell and I'm a member of an organization called Bike for Peace in Norway. And we are very, congratulations with the Nobel Peace Prize. That's very interesting. But the last speaker said about 27. Okay, uh, UN, but uh, he said 42. Are many of them want to be member in the East? And very interesting and talk about Azerbaijan and so on. I want to hear a little bit more about how many more want to be member of Europe in Europe. <laughs> so that was for me, you, Mr. Joe Line, I think. How many more countries want to be member of the European Union? The United States of America have 51 uh, members. So we have 27, so there is a lot of space uh, upwards. <laughs> I don't know how many, but uh, I know that nine are in a pipeline who have uh, uh, asked for membership and others want to, but know that the time is not yet there. We will be much more than 30. Okay, we'll take one question at a time for the, for the time being, and then I might collect afterwards. Yeah, we have a question here. Yes, hi. My name is uh, Camilla Strasbourg, and I'm from the Conservative Party here in Norway. Uh, thank you for coming here and sharing your thoughts. We're very interested in your thoughts with us. Uh, I guess few people question the role the EU played in securing peace after the Second World War. But we have new tasks to take on now. Uh, you have talked about the economic situation, you've talked about other problems, but we also see the rise of political extremism in some of our countries, uh, we see the rise of nationalism. And maybe as a result of the economic situation, it's happening in several places. Uh, and my question is, what role can the EU play in fighting these tendencies in Europe? And what mechanism does the EU have in securing all of its members, civil, political, and human rights? And which member of the panel was that to? Uh? Maybe we can, whoever feels that. <laughs> Madam Reddy? Yeah. Everybody. As I said already before, um, when the money is missing, the fights are growing. And exactly this is also happening uh, now in Europe, and I think in several countries. But we are a continent based on the rule of law, uh, with very clear uh, questions uh, laid down in the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, on non-discrimination, and uh, the uh, fight against racism and uh, exclusion of other uh, people. So this can be uh, taken into uh, in front of the national courts, uh, that uh, the European rules go to national courts. And you have seen that each time something is going wrong in a member state. Uh, I give you the last two examples. Uh, one was the of the judiciary in Hungary, and the other one was the elimination of the uh, uh, higher court in Romania. Um, the commissioner responsible for justice stood up and said, no, that is not the way to proceed. And then something very important happened, and I think you should know that here in Norway. The Secretary General of the Council of Europe, uh, Mr. Jagland, stood up together with me and said also no from the part of the Council of Europe. So it was a real joint venture between the European Union and the Council of Europe in order to say no, we are built on rules of respect and on rules where every human being counts. And you cannot by, national, um, uh, by nationalistic and uh, fighting against human beings uh, build a community. 
we are going to oppose this and we have opposed it. Mr. Aide, you had some comment as well? Quick comment as well to Strandskogen's uh, question. I think, um, I mean, it's, it's a serious uh, concern uh, that we have to follow that development, whether the crisis produces extremism, and to a certain extent it has happened. Uh, I, I would like to say two things. One is that in our in the Norway grounds, which is our contribution to the, uh, uh, particularly the newer members, we have a particular focus on uh, civil society organizations dealing with minorities and and, uh, um, and other activities, which is in, in you know there to strengthen civil society um, in that part of, of Europe. But my second reflection is that maybe the EU is actually doing exactly the right thing. The last time around, we had this kind of crisis in the 1930s. Uh, uh, nationalism rose very quickly, and people, the different countries tried to solve their domestic economic problem by exporting it to their neighbors. Now the response is the opposite, is trying to find common solution. So maybe what we're just seeing right now is that the very presence of the EU institutions, but also the norm and morale that comes with them is actually working. And look at some of the late uh, la um, l last uh, elections. The Netherlands, for instance, the extremist parties actually lost the election, and moderate parties, center left, center right, won the election, which actually suggests that it's the other way around, that so far it hasn't really happened. But we should remain vigilant, and we should continue to speak up against hate speech and the, uh, in the search for the, the, the culpable group and trying to, to do our best to maintain sort of this sort of broad consensus uh, approach to solving a shared problem in Europe. Mr. Sheftorovic. Thank you very much. Only a very short comment. I think Into what would also... Into the microphone, please. Yes. Into what? the microphone. Please. I see. Yeah. Or the, I, Closer to it. You know, I... Yeah. Oops, too low. Uh, I think what also would uh, help in this endeavor would be if uh, uh, we would be a little bit m more fair to Europe. I think over the last decade uh, some strange game started to be played around, so if there is something very positive it's always the success of the national government. Yeah. If there is a problem, so these guys in Brussels did it. And I think the, the, the citizens, they very often uh, relate to the European Union and European affairs uh, through the perspective, through the comments and statements of the national politicians. And I think that we have to share the successes, failures, the problems, but we have to really uh, do this uh, together because this would help us to have a fair argument. You mentioned Netherlands. I have to say that I was very much impressed uh, by the citizens' activism before elections, be it business associations, agriculturalists, youth, who was just telling how important important it is to be in the EU, how much uh, all of us benefit from that. And I think uh, we would need uh, more voices like that to have really fair debate in the media and uh, in the political circles, and that would definitely help as well. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question over here. Hi. Uh, Mr. Sandwich, um, first of all, congratulations. Uh, your, your name and affiliation, please. Uh, my name is Ian Cooper. I'm a researcher at ARENA at the University of Oslo. Um, and I have a question about democracy. Clearly this, this prize is as much about democracy as about peace, um, and the EU is a remarkably successful democracy promoter, but people have questioned how democratic is the EU itself. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, for an international organization, it's remarkably democratic. And mm. one example is that national parliaments just use their new powers to uh, defeat a controversial right, uh, regulation of the right to strike. And that was controversial here in Norway. Mm. So could you reflect on the ongoing democratization of the EU itself? I will repeat the question because there are some people down here who does not hear it. Um, the question was about democracy and the European Union and, and whether the panel could elaborate on, on the democratic issues of the European Union and perhaps the democratic problems. And if I can link up to that, I could say that some of the criticism in this country and perhaps some other places against giving the Peace Prize to the European Union is that the European Union has a huge democratic deficit. So every time power and competences are transferred to the European uh, Union, it means not more democracy, but, but less democracy. That would be some of the criticism. If, uh, I think the question was first to Mr. Sheftorich. Please. Thank, thank you very much. I, I think that if uh, somebody has this feeling about democratic deficit, I would very much like to welcome uh, all of them to the European Parliament. And then Joe can tell you that how hard time we uh, from the Commission uh, can get there sometimes. But I understand that, uh, uh, that the question was also very much related how we can involve more national parliaments. Because I think that now the, the good thing is that uh, national parliaments feel 
how the European Union is clearly uh, present in the member states, how they are affecting daily lives of the, of the citizens. And I think we will see more of it when we will uh, deepen the integration, especially uh, building the economic and, and monetary union. And now we are in the situation that once uh, we would integrate more, one, uh, once more of these very important economic or budgetary competencies will be managed uh, uh, as a shared competence collectively, then the national parliaments would like to be involved. And we are going into the area where some of the competencies might overlap or where the dividing line is a little bit blurred. And therefore, I think here uh, we have clearly to find the answers how we can involve national parliaments more into the, into the EU policy. I think Herman van Rompuy even said that when the national parliaments deal with the EU affairs, they are also European institutions. And I think that we are now in the process of finding the way where the democratic scrutiny and accountability would be uh, done at appropriate level level for what uh, decision. As, uh, as it was rightly pointed out, for the first time we had, uh, the, we had uh, the, 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 the yellow card uh, uh, this uh, September. It clearly showed the national parliaments can get uh, well organized. They can check the, what they believe uh, uh, was uh, under the subsidiarity or over the subsidiarity uh, considerations and uh, the Commission has withdrawn its proposal. And I believe that we will see more of it uh, in, uh, in the future. And uh, for those who had the chance to look through the blueprint the Commission presented, how to build the economic and monetary union, so we would see that there is a whole chapter on how to work with the democratic scrutiny, how to improve the democratic accountability, and how important it would be to find uh, the ways of interparliamentary uh, co coordination and cooperation because we are accountable to the European Parliament, but I know that the European Parliament wants to have very, very close link on this issue with the national parliaments as well. Thank you. I know both Vivian Redding and Joe Lyon wants to comment on this as well. Vivian, please. Yes, because uh, I think that this uh, democratic deficit is a myth. Um, look, the European Parliament is voted directly by the European citizens. And it has very big powers. It has the power of co-decision on nearly all the um, laws which are being brought out. That means if the parliament says no, there is no law. And it has also a very big power concerning the European government. And I do not know how the situation is here in Norway. But in the European Parliament, and in order a member of the government to become member of the government, goes through a grilling, through a hearing of the European <coughs> Parliament and can be thrown out. Uh, I know most of the European um, Union governments do not have that. Um, ministers are just nominated and that's it. Here the Parliament has a big power. Uh, so I do think that we overdo this with a slogan which has very little to do uh, with the reality. Now, because um, a, a lot of um, national governments feel frustrated because actually, yes, it is a European Parliament which takes the real decision and not them anymore, the Parliament has started to work together with the national governments on, uh, uh, parliaments on a given subject. For instance, data protection, new law in the pipeline. The European Parliament works three days together with representatives of all the national uh, parliaments in order to find a common way out. So this happens all the time. I believe it is a wonderful <coughs> creation and I do not believe in the democratic deficit. We are going nevertheless in order to make this democracy more visible presenting some changes for the next elections. For the next elections, for instance, all the big party families will come out with one candidate uh, for the president of the European uh, Commission. Uh, so that while voting for their members of parliament, the citizens of Europe also can say this is the direction the future policy uh, should take. So it is not perfect, but it is more perfect than in most democracies, in most uh, uh, countries in the world. And the last perfection, we are going to put it step by step, even to become more democratic as it is today and certainly more uh, democratic than any other international organization. Mr. Joe Lyne, you have a comment as well? Yeah, that's exactly the point. The uh, European Union is the very first uh, experiment in the whole world to have democracy on a trans-border, transnational level. It doesn't exist nowhere. 
And the European Parliament is the only parliament elected directly by the people uh, on a transnational uh, basis, let's say in 27 member states. Um, and uh, that is uh, in a way new and uh, it is an experiment and it is building up. And I would say that uh, the European Parliament is much uh, more uh, uh, lively than many of the national parliaments because uh, we have not a born majority. Every issue has to find its own majority. And we resemble much more to the American Congress where they have to struggle to get a majority on an issue than on national parliaments where it's given by the majority that covers the government. Mm -hmm. So I, I would join my uh, colleagues and it's wonderful <laughs> to see how the European Commission defends the European Parliament. Uh, the other way around would not necessarily be the case <laughs> because we have to scrutinize them. We are very and, critical and, and, you and do, uh, you do. <laughs> come uh, to Strasbourg. Uh, today starts our plenary week in Strasbourg. I go there later on and you will see how we attack uh, and how we criticize. Uh, it's a very lively thing. Last word, there is a misconception uh, again and again and again that you give up sovereignty. That's not the concept. We are sharing sovereignty to make us stronger together. We are not giving up sovereignty. Uh, the governments are still in uh, the council uh, and uh, vote. Uh, the members of the respective countries are in the parliament and vote. So we are sharing sovereignty. That's the new concept. We are not giving up sovereignty. Mr. Mavrianis, very brief. Very briefly, yes. Uh, just let me say that uh, uh, sometimes we overstate the position by saying that only the European Parliament is legitimate because it is directly elected. As I was saying before, in the European Union there is a plurality of sources of uh, democratic legitimacy. And the national governments, as uh, Mr. Leiner was saying, are also legitimate and they, they have their own functions and they are uh, in the council which is the co-legislator. So along with the European Parliament. So pluralism in uh, the sources of legitimacy, in uh, democratic scrutiny, transparency, an institutional balance, and all those things. And uh, I was covered by what uh, Mr. Leinen was saying. Pooling of sovereignty is exercising sovereignty. Nothing more and nothing less. I think we could have this discussion for very many hours. We don't have that. So what I will do now is that I have a list which Christian has given me. I will take three or four more questions and I will add a couple of myself. And then we will have a final round in, in the adverse order, starting by the, the last one, Mr. Joe Line, and, and then going back. Yeah. The so points. then you can choose which questions you want to, to answer. And the first on my list is uh, Trygve Nordby. Thank you. Trygve Nordby. Uh, I appreciate uh, the strong normative framework we have in the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights and I also appreciate the willingness to uh, fight for these rights but I'm questioning the ability to, uh, for instance, sanction against member states that reach these rights. You have now opened a new office in um, Vienna uh, which is the Fundamental Rights Agency and we see the, the, the forming of um, an asylum support office uh, in Malta. Would these offices, these new bureaus, be the vehicles you will use in promoting and also sanction breaches of fundamental rights within the Union? That was the first question concerning the basic human rights of the European Union and their effectiveness. The second person on the list is Luisa Lurke. Yes? That was a very easy, short, but difficult to answer question. How can the Nobel Peace Prize be used afterwards? Uh, we will we'll collect and then we'll get to. Sorry. Inspiration or reference. Reference. Yeah. Inspiration or threaten. Weapon. Weapon. Yes. Uh, third, Espen Baglarsen. I'm uh, representing the European Youth Movement in Norway, and my question goes to Vivian Redding, the Nobel Commissioner. And uh, you're a national of one of the EU's uh, smallest countries, uh, and also one of the founding members of the European Union. Uh, from your perspective, how does one ensure that uh, the EU, as a foreign policy actor as a, and as a promoter of peace, does not act in the interest of the biggest countries, as uh, Germany and France or, or the United Kingdom? 
but act uh, on behalf of the union as a whole. Thank you. That was another interesting question. How can we assure that uh, the EU, as an organization, acts on behalf of all the member states, the big ones and the small ones, and not just that it is a vehicle for, for the bigger states in, in promoting peace in, in the world? <coughs> so I have one more question. Thomas Weidnes. Thank you very much. I'm a journalist in Abyssinia today. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. On the economic interrelations as a driver for peace within the EU, uh, how does how does this influence on on the drive for liberalisation and liberalism? Is that important for peace building? Thank you. And then I have a couple of final questions myself, which you may or may not take into account when you're going to make your conclusive remarks. Uh, and the first is that we have had five introductions, which have been, of course, very positive to the European uh, Union getting the, the peace prize. At the same time, we should remember that this is a controversial prize. It is controversial in some areas in, in Europe. It's contra more controversial in some countries than in others. In, in the UK, they are making fun of this peace prize. And it is quite controversial in, in this country. And, uh, and the critics are, are saying different things. Some are saying that the EU is not democratic enough. Some are saying that the EU is really not uh, is really not making peace. It's not the, the EU that made the Iron Curtain fall, and it's not the EU that stopped the wars in the, in the, on the Balkans, and, it, and it's not the EU that uh, built democracy in Spain or Portugal or, or, or Greece. Uh, so it's not the, the, the EU that is doing these things. It's, uh, it's the Americans and other forces. So that's some of the criticism, and, and there are other criticisms. Uh, as well. Some is saying that, well, the EU is a big provider of development aid, but it's also a big provider of military arms, and it's not contributing to, to uh, uh, disarmament like, like Nobel wanted. On the contrary, it is a big, uh, the countries of the European Union are, are large weapon exporters. So there's a lot of criticism also to this. And, and on the one hand, you get this criticism, and on the other hand, you get introductions like in the panel saying that uh, the European Union is, is not only a big peace project, but perhaps a the ultimate and, and very successful peace project. Uh, and my question, which is difficult, is that we have such competing visions. Is this because people are disagreeing about the facts, or are we talking about different kind of analysis? Are we talking about different visions? Or are the people who are criticizing this prize simply ignorant and, and stupid and, and wrong? Uh, that would be my first question. Uh, and, the, and the second question is that uh, for the guests from the European Union, uh, I suppose that uh, the everyday political agenda in the European Union, at least for the last two or three years, has been, has been very much dominated by the economic crisis. Uh, and now you have this happy chance to come to, to Oslo and break away from the crisis for a couple of days and discuss something <laughs> nice, uh, EU as a peace project and the fundamentals. But when you go back the day after tomorrow, will it be just business uh, as usual? Uh, or will this price have some kind of, of lasting effect on the EU as a peace project and if so what kind of effect I think this links up to some of the questions so now you have a lot on your, your block now you have two to three minutes each to have your conclusive remarks and we start by mr. Joe line please yeah um, the very idea of European integration is a big challenge and it remains a big challenge and we have to live with it that no not everybody shares uh, this uh, idea you will always have uh, people who believe uh, in whatever they believe in the nation state and national sovereignty in separatism even i mean look on the british uh, they are still uh, fighting with their identity is it still an empire it's no more an empire are we still important are we not important i think they have to answer that question themselves i will not give them advice <laughs> As European movement, I like them to be in because we have a British European movement. As European parliamentarians, sometimes I want to kick them out because they are annoying and blocking us all the time. And we should not allow them to block us. Now, um, uh, many things that are said uh, against the EU, just uh, as you mentioned them uh, 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 as others are doing, it's not the EU, it's, uh, let's say, Europe, of course, the member states, uh, arms exports. The European Union is not exporting arms. Yeah, we have no arms. Uh, we have no army. Uh, of course, nobody is perfect. Uh, and uh, we could now, uh, I could daily uh, speak about uh, deficits we have and uh, failures we have, no, no, no doubt. I said my Bavarian prime minister 
in a Bavarian beer tent, Oktoberfest, it would be more easy for me, as president of the European movement, to have an emotional speech against Europe. Well, how can they do that in Brussels? How do they dare? And such things. It's so easy. And now I could speak against Europe. It's much uh, more difficult to speak in favor of Europe. Because uh, people say, ah, oh, peace and freedom and uh, no border control, we all have that. So uh, your question, uh, whether the economic uh, uh, world is a driver, uh, of course, but with all the problems as well. Uh, I think that uh, free trade is good, but it has to have limits. And uh, if you look now on China, uh, how unfair trade is, uh, then I think uh, Europe is as well an area to protect uh, us against unfair competition. And last, uh, to Luisa's question, of course, this Nobel Prize is an inspiration. It will wake up lots of spirits that have been now sleeping. And uh, it is a, a, not a weapon but it is a reference to come to basics, to, to come about the, the core idea of European uh, uh, integration, and not, as I said, about two-pack, six-pack, uh, fiscal pact, and all the instruments we need as well. That is not Europe. The idea is what is rewarded today. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mavrianis. Thank you very much. I think that uh, the vocation of the European Union is to uh, have a soft power. European Union is not about might in international relations, and uh, what we are trying to do is to lead by example. It's not about exporting our values and ideals. Uh, it's about uh, you know making uh, this uh, attraction of the European Union uh, bigger and bigger. And we see the effects now, for instance, in the Balkan uh, region, where the force of abstraction of the European Union is the m main stabilizer in the area, and this prospect of accession to the European Union is what brings people closer to democratic transformation and closer also to being part of the European dream. Uh, at the same time, uh, we need to bear in mind that even when we export our goods or we try to be competitive, for us, competitiveness and uh, all other economic notions, and we are being through difficult times right now, are just the tools in order to achieve the fundamentals, which is uh, peace, quality of life, and our social model in uh, Europe, and uh, we need to bear this in mind. So I wouldn't agree more with uh, what Mr. Leinen was saying, that the Nobel is a reminder of the essence of the European process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Cefcevich. <clears throat> Thank you very much. At first, uh, of course, we, we have to respect uh, uh, the role of the uh, United States and, uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the absolutely crucial contribution to the, to the conclusion of the Cold War. But I would say that for many countries like mine, this was just the new beginning. I cannot describe in this short period of time how much we've been helped by the European Union, by the member states, uh, being it technical assistance, being it uh, adoption of what I consider one of the most modern uh, law code in the world, which is called ACQUI or, or the, or the European, European law. How it modernized, the, I would say, all walks of, uh, of how the societies in the new member state, uh, member state functions. How much the, the cohesion funds help the uh, new member states uh, to modernize. Why the Poland or Slovakia are growing so rapidly. I think this has a lot to do with it. The recent uh, figures, because we discuss a lot uh, the budgets these days, uh, says very clear that in most of the new member states, 75% of the public investment are done thanks to the EU funds. And this is not uh, the win only for the new member states because 50% of the money goes to the companies coming from the net contributors. So this is, I would say, win-win project which is actually helping uh, to make European economy stronger. And I think that the World Bank uh, described the EU or the cohesion policy the, 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 the best uh, uh, machine for overcoming the regional differences. And I, and I really think that, uh, that this, is, uh, this is true. Concerning the question on liberalism, I, I think that uh, uh, we would agree that we are not using the potential of single market enough. 
and we can give you with Vivian many figures uh, how much uh, our economies uh, and our citizens would benefit if we would uh, able to, uh, to get rid of remaining barriers faster. Just one figure if we would manage to really put all our efforts uh, in place uh, uh, what we suggested under the, the uh, digital agenda until 2020, this alone would mean 4% of the GDP for the EU, which is a lot of a lot of money. And there are many other uh, projects we are putting on the table where we believe that the potential would be huge. And the last uh, comment uh, would be on uh, inspiration or weapon. I believe it would be the inspiration and the motivation because there is a famous quote that uh, for the evil to prevail, it's enough if uh, few good men and women are just silent. And I hope that the debate we have here, uh, the, uh, the discussion which the Nobel Prize uh, brought to the, to the EU uh, subject will help us to put for a while this usual cynicism <laughs> apart and uh, we definitely uh, in the Commission feel increased uh, responsibility and I hope that uh, also the awarding of this prize will help us to have uh, the more fairer, more open and, uh, and, and better debate on Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Madame Reding, you want the, the big floor? <laughs> I prefer to stand here because I can also speak to the people uh, in the back, yeah. if not they only see my back. Well, three uh, <laughs> short uh, answers to short questions and one personal story to finish. The first question was about who is implementing the rights well, and sanctions, if there are sanctions to be taken. Well, it is the national courts which have the power to implement European rules. So you do not need to go to the European Court of Justice, but it is the national judges who become national uh, European judges de facto. The Agency of Fundamental Rights is one which makes analysis. It is the politicians who make laws, and it is the courts who implement laws with the sanctions. Small member states, well, you have so many examples here. Uh, first, I am the first vice president of the European government, coming from Luxembourg. And my prime minister of Luxembourg is the president of the Eurogroup, the boss about 17 member states and the biggest currency in the world. So you see, small member states can take a lot of power, but it is not about power. It is about sharing the influence with others in order to work for the 500 million citizens. That's what it is about. Are we going to go back and and it is business as usual. Well, I can tell you, yes, for me, it's going to be business as usual. Because my business is to make out of this continent a real continent of freedom and of justice. So yes, I got courage to continue with my business as <laughs> usual. And I promised you a personal story. Yesterday evening, I was having dinner with your Minister of Justice. So, the European Minister of Justice and the Minister of Justice from Norway. She told to me, you are coming from Luxembourg, from Escher Alzette. You are born in Escher Alzette. And I looked at her, that's the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and she said, how do you know Escher Alzette? <laughs> Well, she said, I spent a lot of my childhood in Eschuralzet <laughs> because my father, who was in the concentration camp of Natzweiler, could only survive because a citizen of Eschuralzet shared his food with him. And so this Norwegian father of the today's Minister of Justice survived because one of my electors in Escher Alzet was sharing his food with him in a Nazi concentration camp. And we are speaking why we need Europe.
if there's more of this applause, we won't have time for the last intervention. <laughs> Mr. Espen Bartaide, please. You want me to come up? <laughs> if you want to. It's amazing. Uh -huh. yeah. It's incredible. Thank you. I think um, this has been an extremely inspiring uh, breakfast morning and uh, took away a, good of, uh, good, a lot of good points. Uh, a very, very few comments in the end. First to Luisa's question. Inspiration because it reminds us of the big picture. And I think in, in the EU, what I'm detecting here and also in other conversations with European leaders since the prize was awarded, that's, that's what they take out of it. A reminder of the long story, the big picture, which is sometimes important because the day-to-day -day business is not about that, but about you know, more current affairs. So I think that's an, an important answer. Then on the democracy thing. I, first, I fully agree that the EU is perfectly in its right to say that it's the most democratic international institution. And a lot of the people who criticize the EU for being undemocratic are very positive to organizations with no democratic fundament, at, or, or, which are still good and important institutions because they bring countries together, which, which has neither a requirement to be a democracy to be a member, nor do they have a parliamentary basis. Second observation is that many have been following the Norwegian EU debate actively for more than three decades. Some of the people who are currently saying that the EU is undemocratic used to say that it was undemocratic because the European Parliament had no power, which was true hmm. 30 years ago. Now the same people think it's undemocratic because the institutions, including the European Parliament, has too much power. Right. So now it's undemocratic because the nation state is you know, subdued to inst international institutions. The same people, I could mention names, I don't want to because they're not here. <laughs> but it's exact, exactly the same people are making, but it's, regardless, it's undemocratic. <laughs> then I would say if 500 million Europeans were of the same opinion, I would be deeply concerned. Because part of the story of Europe is that we disagree and then we have institutions uh, in which we sort of still come up with a solution through deliberation. So I'm actually glad that not everybody in neither the EU nor in Norway thinks the same thing about this integration project. But I think it is a good thing and I think it is proven its worth. Then, to be, then I want also to mention that my concern uh, right now is the danger of the EU becoming too inward looking. That because of the crisis, which you of course have to solve, so much of the attention is on your internal workings, which takes away the energy that we used to have, and which I hope we have again for the EU on the global scene. And that's a real danger. And again, on that note, I want to conclude by saying that that is also a part of the big picture look up from the internal debates and look at what is the contribution to the world. It was well said by Jo Leinen, the African Union is modeled yeah. on the European Union. They have a long way to go, but it's a vast improvement over the organization of African unity, which was a very sort of sovereignty-based traditional international organization. <laughs> no, they're trying to have a real integration project on an all-African level. That's a great inspiration, and it has been inspired by the European Union and similar projects. This is the kind of things that the EU has to do, in addition to discussing its internal workings. Uh, the Nobel Committee is uh, completely independent of the government. That's a very important point. Um, we always um, uh, turn up in, uh, uh, to celebrate uh, the winner, whether we agree with the winner or not. But I'm very happy to say that I think this was an extremely wise uh, prize. Uh, I personally agree with it. We are so democratic in this country that even in the government there are different opinions uh, on this. Um, but I belong to those who look very much forward to a great day with all the European leaders in Norway. Thank you for the attention.